Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Thriving Adoptees podcast. Uh, so today I'm delighted to be uh, to, to be joined by the lovely Jenna. Hi, Jenna. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, so could you introduce yourself to the, um, the listeners, please, Jenna? Sure. My name is Jenna Howard and I am an adoptee. So I was adopted back in the time of the closed adoptions in the United States. So it was a domestic adoption. And I have worked in the adoption field since 1994. So I've worked both with adopted parents and with birth mothers and um, adoptees. And so, and then in 2013, our family actually adopted a little girl from China. So we have um, four biological boys, and then um, we added Emma to our family. Right. Um, so I'm also an adoptive parent. Right. Fantastic. And uh, I was saying before we started recording that I'm just so delighted to, to have you on and uh, to give to, to have that kind of expertise. You, you are the first uh, adoptee and uh, adoptive mum. Uh, that we've had on, on the show so I think you know it's going to be a re- for me it's going to be a really intriguing uh, I'm in really intrigued to hear what you've got to say um, and also the fact that you you know you've you've got as you say you've got the four biological um, uh, kids and, and, and your uh, adopted daughter so this is going to be like a uh, yeah this is going to be a great this is going to be a great episode so um, yeah so I like to ask people to um, when guests come on the show I like to ask them what what comes to their mind when I, I say these uh, this word? Uh, the, the name of the podcast is Thriving Adoptees. So what does Thriving Adoptees, what does that mean to you, Jenna? Well, I think it's the same thing every parent wants for their child, right? So a child that grows up that's happy and healthy and has a good sense of self and um, productive member of society and just um, healthy emotionally. Yeah, great. That's great. And what does it, and does that, so that means for you as well? Yes. Adult, and, adult yes. And um, so I've had, I've been fortunate enough to find out who my biological family is. Um, I met a biological brother in 1995, so a while ago, and found out actually my birth mom was already deceased by that time. Oh, and then, yeah, it was actually, I had to grieve that a little bit. And, um, and actually, a, almost um, a year ago, I met my biological father for the first time. And that's wow. been very positive. It's been a very positive thing. But I've been able to see, um, you know, adoptees always wonder what would my life had been like if. And um, I've kind of been blessed to be able to see the challenges I would have had if I had not been placed for adoption. And I just am incredibly thankful for my adoption and thankful that um, my birth mom made that choice because I know it was difficult for her yeah. and that she knew it was going to be the best thing for me and it's it has been a blessing not that there aren't challenges from being adopted there are but overall I feel extremely blessed yeah right so can you share us a little bit more about that 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 story Jenna about your story sure so um Growing up, so growing up, I have an older sibling who's also adopted, and then I have two, um, a brother and a sister who are biological to my parents. So I grew up in a family with adopted children and biological children. So, um, and my older brother never cared to know about his birth family, never cared to go down that road. Um, But for me, it was always something very important, and I always wanted to have the answers, and um, so it's something I was going to do a search, um, but before I got to that point, I was newly married and um, received a letter from the agency that placed me saying they had updated information. And within an hour, I was talking on the phone to my biological brother. Wow. So it was very fast. And then, um, you know, he's the one that had to tell me he was raised by our my birth mother until um she died and so he's the one that actually had to tell me Um, and she died she was murdered and it's still an unsolved case so it's very um a lot to take in for that time yeah wow i can't even start to imagine um 
my 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 search was took a lot longer but it was i also found that she, she my birth mother had died before i started searching but it was uh was nowhere near as dramatic uh as as that you know um yeah that must have been that must have been a shock for you it was and you know you always as an adoptee i always wanted to meet her and thank her for what she did for me and then um and to let her know i was okay yeah. and i never was able to do that so yeah, that must have been a shame, right? Eh? Yeah. Okay. Wow. Um, so this was just after, did you say this was just after you'd got married? Married, yes. Yeah. So it was under, it was in that first year of marriage that this happened, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then you went on to have four, four of your own child, children, and then later the, uh, you did the, uh, the adoption, yeah? Yes. So, um, yeah, so we we really, you know, I was always open to adoption, of course, um, but it was also very important for me to have a biological child as possible. I think that connection, I wanted that. And um, so we had four boys and I love my boys. They're wonderful, and, um, but I always wanted a daughter too. And so, um, so that's when we decided to um, adopt yeah. and um, we chose, to adopt from China because um, in the U.S., you know, there are lots of families wanting to adopt newborn infants, and and we didn't um, we didn't need that experience, and we didn't want to take that away from someone because oh. we could have biological children, and yeah. so we um, we looked at the foster care system, but we didn't want a situation where we'd have a child for a while and then the child would be removed, yeah. and and so that's why we decided to go. Um, adopt from China yeah. and she was two years old when she came home yeah, yeah. okay and how old is she now she's 10 she's 10 all right so it's eight mm -hmm. years ago wow wow so how did your um did you say you've been working in adoption since 1994 yes yeah wow so uh, obviously it was your experience as an adoptee is that what informed you is that why you decided to absolutely yeah. yes yeah. yeah. So what was behind it? What what was your thinking? What was your feeling? Why why did you uh, make that uh, professional? Sure. Move? Well, when I was in graduate school, um, we I was just always interested in working in the adoption field and we had to do a little um, interview. And so I chose an adoption agency to do the interview just be, because that's what I was interested in. And they ended up um, letting me do an internship there and it just my career went off from there so yeah. um but it was always i always wanted um to kind of give back for what i felt like i'd been given and um it was kind of a way to for me to honor and respect the birth parents because i i know i know my birth mom it was um a sacrifice for her and something she felt like was best for me and um my birth father actually didn't know of my existence until a year ago. So um, he didn't even know she was pregnant. So wow. Wow. But, amazing. It's amazing. So um, did, did you actually go to work for uh, full time for the agency where you did the internship or was that a different agency? Yes. No. So I worked there for several years and then um, I started doing contract work more for a while because I had young boys at home. Yeah. And so it, it got harder to balance um, working with birth parents and taking care of young children. So I did some contract work for several years. And then I started actually um, my own agency that was focused on home studies. All right. Yeah. Fantastic. And then um, I guess a little over six years ago, I went back into the um, I started working at American Adoptions. Um, I'm the executive director of the Texas office. Yeah. So I went more to the newborn infant adoption side. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Wow, what a story. Yeah. Um, so how old are you boys? How old are you boys? My oldest is 23. So they're 23, 22, um, 19, and 15. Yeah, wow, so. that's fantastic. That's fantastic. And they they adore their little sister, and they, um, yeah, she's very spoiled. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess a pro protector as well, right? Eh? Yes, yeah. but she she adores them too. It's very it's 
it's been very positive. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So um, the as as we said just before uh, we started the recording, the the main uh, my main aim with the uh, the thriving adoptees podcast is to give that inspirational piece and that clearly you know what you've done what you've been through and how you've taken that into your professional life is surely an inspiration so we want to get to the empowerment piece as well so what is it that you've um that you've learned uh, about um both i guess in in your um, uh, personal life and, and in your professional life that helps adoptees thrive what 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 would you, what lessons would you like to to to, sh to share I think the biggest thing I want adoptive parents and adoptees to know is that, um, I mean, there there are issues that I have because I'm adopted. There are certain, you know, especially things like rejection issues and things like that. There are things I feel deeper than probably other people, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. And I think sometimes it, people are saying it is a bad thing, but to me, it's made me more compassionate in some places and more, I look more to people and, and see some of their hurt more and I'm able to um, help empower them and help, help them. And I think everybody, no matter what your life story is, you have hard things in it. Everybody has hard things and that's not bad. It makes you the person you are. And so um, I, I you know, adoption is not a bad thing for me. It's not, it's, it's a thing that has shaped some of my personality and some of the things I believe and see, but um, that's not bad. That's just makes me who I am. And, and a lot of times those things are strengths. I feel they're strengths. Yeah. So I, are you saying, I mean, I, I totally, I totally agree with you. Um, uh, I, I, you know, as in like a, adoption as a good thing and part of our personality shapes our personality but um perhaps you know underneath underneath that personality you know who are we where um the bit that you really that i really liked is the bit that you talked about at the, to at the start of that segment when you were talking about how um perhaps being aware feeling your rejection more um intensely perhaps or um more often than uh somebody else has would you say that's made you more empathetic absolutely 100 percent, and and more um, aware of the people who in a crowd who are more off to the side or more you know it's made me aware i don't want other people to have that feeling yeah 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 so how how does that help you jenna well, it definitely helps me professionally because that's, I mean, as a social worker, that's kind of um, our job is empowerment and helping those on the margin sometimes. And so, um, yeah, and I mean, personally, I feel like it makes me a better mom. So, and it definitely makes me a better adoptive mom. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm, I'm aware of what those issues could be. And so I can help my daughter navigate those issues. And of course, adoption, back when I was adopted, it was a different, professionals had a different view of it. Um, and so like my parents were taught to treat me just like a biological child. And, you know, um, adoption discussions were really discouraged. And um, so, and for me, that was probably fine for my brother, but it wasn't for me, it wasn't what I needed. I needed to process it. I needed to talk about it and I needed it to be an open, um, discussion and not a big emotional discussion every time and so um, and I don't blame my parents for that that's the advice they were given and the um, the professional advice at the time and so I think um, as professionals as we've learned more we understand better the dynamics and what helps adoptees and what helps birth parents heal and what helps adoptive parents and um you know, at the key, at the heart of that is relationship and openness and communication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how how has that um, how has that helped you with your with your daughter, Jenna? Um, well, I mean, it's just we have. Of course, she'll know she's adopted because she's Chinese and we're um, Caucasian, yeah. but um, just 
adoption is a very open conversation in our house and it's just something um, it almost comes up every day not just also because of my job but um, she yeah. feels very comfortable with the fact she's adopted and she is able to tell other people she's adopted with and without any worries you know it's something she's very comfortable I can also see with her some areas um, she tends to avoid hard things, like not not hard to do, but emotional, sad things. So she wants to um, keep things happy and cheerful. And so sometimes it's harder for her to um, work through some of the more negative feelings that come with adoption. But she's also 10, so she's still got a lot of time to work through things. But um, yeah. Yeah, but we talk openly about her birth parents. And of course, we don't know them because it's a China of adoption. But um, it's just adoption is a comfortable topic in our house. Yeah, yeah. So because um, in the kind of the, the adult adoptee community, um, I see uh, a lot of people talking about interracial uh, adoption and um, and the feeling that that gives uh, th that brings another layer of complexity yes. to um, to the adoption process. Yes, and, and I, I'm yeah, I very much thought I was prepared for an interracial adoption, and it's been um, a, a lot more difficult than I imagined. And I think you know, here in the U.S., we have a lot of um, racial strife going on right now, and and a lot is aimed toward Asian Americans. So um, there's there's that piece, but I just, um, it's been surprising to me. Some people that seem to have an issue, um, I'm, I'm not saying they're racist, but they just at more had an issue with her ethnicity than I expected. And it's been um, a little eye-opening. Um, yeah. And, you know, we work really hard. Um, we have Chinese friends and um, we, she's around other people. We try to, we're in a school district with some diversity. So she's not the only Asian face. And then um, we, she takes Mandarin lessons. Yeah. Um, try to maintain that. We're, we're gonna do a cultural camp this summer and she'll meet other adoptees from China. She knows some already, but. But we're very aware of all of that and try to do our best and, and also recognize that we can't do it perfectly and um, we're just going to do the best we can and um, we don't regret adopting her at all even with the additional challenges yeah, yeah. so what what were some of the obviously you, you've talked about the people having an issue with the um, uh, ethnicity what are some of the other surprises that you've had um, that you kind of wish you'd known about before? Um, really bad. I mean, just that, I mean, some people will do openly racist things in front of her. And even if you ask them to stop, they don't. And it's just very, um, those are things you, you know they exist, but you don't really understand it and know they exist until you're living in. And as a white person, I didn't see a lot of those things. Right. And so, um, yeah, and people I thought would be super supportive just weren't. And then people I never imagined would be her biggest cheerleaders are, you know, so there's the positive too. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible, isn't it? We never it, it, it is. The, the expectations, which way it's gonna, which way it's gonna go. And it may not, I mean, I think the political situation in our country right now is probably um, making all of that worse. So maybe it wouldn't have been so bad if um, yeah. the racial issues in our country weren't so bad right now. Has it changed then, do you think? Or, 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 or was, there, was there some, has it just got, has it just got worse? Was there, was there some issues before? I mean, I don't, uh, the Black Lives that's Matter. That's it, that's it, that's it. Right. And that's an interesting question. I don't know, has it gotten worse or is it just more out in the open? Yeah. And am I just more aware of it now? So um, I don't I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that because um, and 
it's never something I had to face before, but it definitely, we had less of it before um, the last yeah. few years. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess we, we can only give our, uh, we can only give our opinions. Uh, we can go only give our opinions on this. And I, I went somewhere close on something this, on, on this subject. And I was giving my, just giving my opinion. And I was, uh, yeah, I was, I was chastised somewhat. Um, for having um, a naive, well, I, I, I think it's a naive opinion. We were talking, I was talking to uh, an American Asian person uh, and, um, you know, I, I thought I was just being naive, but she actually saw it as, so it's my lack of awareness um, rather than a, a prejudice, but she, she, she was actually quite critical of me. And I thought, yeah, I, I guess it's it's the sensitivity that we have to have around yeah. like by lack of awareness I mean that I just hadn't seen it I haven't seen it so you've seen you've seen this stuff um, because obviously we've been out with your daughter um, I haven't seen it so perhaps perhaps I haven't experienced it and maybe I'm, un, I'm therefore underplaying it or maybe once we see it we just become kind of more aware of it um, mm -hmm. but it is it's definitely it, it's, it is definitely yeah uh, an issue you know um and i think here in the uk we we're following the american experience that this stuff is becoming more we're becoming more attuned to it aware of it so yeah. it it's it seems it has it increased or does it just seem that way is it more open who knows you know yeah yeah um so what what um how does your being uh, being adoptee how 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 does that help you with your with your uh, with your daughter? Um, well, I think really it's knowing, um, and she may have different feelings about adoption and, and work with different things, but knowing the areas I struggled in and knowing. Um, what I needed, I try to make sure I'm giving her that, you know, the, the open communication, the um, a, ability to talk about the who her birth parents possibly are, some of those things, and, um, you know, just honoring her birth parents because they are a part of her. And so honoring them and making her know that she can love them and love us. It's not a black and white either or, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Because we we often we often see love as a, a finite resource, you know. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> the whole nature of love is it, it's infinite. You know, we don't uh, we can love. We've got more than enough to 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 go round. It's not like some uh, energy that's depleted, is it? So, um, so it, the key things for you then uh, are they are they the key things. For for you that you would say to an adoptive parent in terms of openness and communication, um, uh, honoring their birth parents, uh, seeing the birth parents as part of, part of them and assuring the child that they can love more than they can love the birth parents and their adoptive parents. Are those the main things or what? Could you break those down for me a little, a little bit more because they seem they seem great, well, and, but it's like, how, what? So, so like all of us face hard things in our life. And when you're going through something hard, um, the people you're able to talk to about it and share with openly the good and the bad and um, the people that are safe to go to, so those are the people you're closest to. And all that does is make your relationship stronger with those people. Um, and it's to me the same thing with adoption. If it's an open conversation and they can share the good and the bad and the sad feelings and the happy feelings um, with you as a parent, all that does is strengthen your relationship and they feel you're a safe person and you're safe for any topic, not just adoption related. Yeah. But um, I mean, that just, um, that's just the foundation of trust and love in a relationship. And that's what you want. You want, um, you want them to have that safe place and you want them to know 
that you're the safe person and they can come with come to you with any of their thoughts and feelings and they're not going to be made fun of and they're um, they're going to be heard and you're there to help if they want help yeah yeah so we're talking about uh, communication and trust as the as the basis for the relationship and interestingly you talk about uh, if things getting tougher and being there then um, that's going to strengthen relationship that the tough times lead to the strengthening relationship for, for the stuff further down the line yeah um, right. that's uh, I guess that's the that's, there's a silver lining there isn't there oh yeah there's, definitely there's, there's, there's a silver lining there like uh, though it doesn't seem that at the time like if so we're talking today on on on, uh, on zoom and that's that's if there is if, if there is a silver lining a small silver lining for from the uh, uh, from all the, the the stuff we've been through all the people that have died it's a tight it's, it's maybe maybe it's a wafer thin silver lining but hopefully we're communicating better and we're communicating more globally you know because we're using zoom all the time with the tech so um yeah there is a silver the silver lining um that perhaps people see later on after they have been, they won't see it in the, if they're going through some tricky stuff with their adopted child right now then and use that that tricky stuff as an opportunity to build the relationship then that's going to make the, the relationship go stronger yeah right yeah um are there any things that you um are there are there any common um I, I, I don't want to use the word mistake, but I can't think of any better way. Um, have you seen areas of, of weakness um, uh, in your, um, with your highly attuned self, your, 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 sorry, your, your highly attuned senses that you, that you clearly have? Uh, where are the areas of weaknesses that you see with, um, within adoptive families relationships? other than lack of communication, you know, is there? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know if you feel the same way, but as an adoptee, there's there's always this loyalty issue and, you know, always this feeling of, um, I have to be loyal to my adopted family. And, you know, just this whole, like when I met my biological father, you know, and when I met my biological brother, I've, I've had a relationship with relationship with him since 1995. And it's, um, it's always, I feel like I need to say he's my biological brother, which is, uh, you know, people look at you funny because no one, you don't introduce someone as a biological brother, but it's, it's the whole loyalty issue. I can't, I feel like I can't um, diminish the relationship with the family I grew up with. And um, I, I, as an adoptive parent, I don't want my daughter to ever feel like she has to do that. She can call me mom and she can call her birth mom and China mom too. And I don't want her to feel, feel that she does have to do that loyalty. I want her to know she is loved unconditionally. She is part of our family. And her birth family is also a part of our family. And it's all, um, I think that for me, that was it. That's always been a big struggle for me. Yeah. So, and, and it may not be with other yeah. situations. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I know some adoptees feel like they can't talk to their adoptive parents about adoption issues because of that loyalty. They don't want to. Um, hurt their adopted family yeah well I mean I feel exactly the same so I've just been to see my mother this lunchtime and um, we we talked about some adoption stuff about tracing my birth mother I don't know I was talking I was, I was sharing with her that uh, that you were coming on and, and we, we got into some conversation about the birth record oh no something in the newspaper there's something in the newspaper yesterday about um, um, you know a, a, a child finding out, uh, you know, below the age of eighteen, finding out um, their the name of their biological mother, and you know this is kind of sh this is shivers down my mum's spine, you know that th this uh, this has happened, you know, and how was it so easy? I said, well, 
if they've got the name, then it's just a Google search. But you know, it, it, they must have got the name from somewhere. So it's about the, the name from from somewhere. Um, uh, and you know, I feel that loyalty thing that you talked about. I feel that loyalty thing that you talked about. You know, I didn't when I did my birth record search about sixteen, six years ago. No, six years ago, I didn't tell my mum about that. I didn't tell my mum or dad about that because mm -hmm. I wanted to be, I wanted to be loyal. Um, so, I'm just wondering how. Well, and when I found out who my birth mom was, it, um, my adoptive family did not handle that well at all. And very, um, I approached it. I wanted it to be open and honest and transparent. And um, it, it was not pretty. It was just really extremely difficult. And, and honestly, it put a barrier between me and my adoptive family for years because I couldn't, I always had to section off a part of me from them instead of, yeah. Um, and it, it was different when I met my biological father, they were a lot more accepting, a lot more years had passed. And yeah, um, yeah. Uh, that's interesting, actually, because I was trying to draw out something uh, hopeful or something learning or something important, you know, for the for the listeners from that. I, I'm, I, I the thing that actually popped into my head is that uh, this stuff does change. So I've seen, I've seen my mum change. You've obviously seen your adoptive parents. Uh, their their attitude has changed over time. Uh, unfortunately, well, yeah, my dad died four years ago. Um, I adopted that. Uh, my dad, yeah. Um, so that's it. I would never say my adoptive dad. You know, I never say <laughs> adoptive mum. You would never say biological. You you would say you say biological brother. Interesting. Very interesting stuff. Yeah. So my dad died four years ago. Um, and I hadn't told my mum really about the search by then. I'm told either of them. I only told them last year, I think. Um, but it does that their, their attitudes have have changed. So I guess uh, uh, for a message of hope out there for any uh, uh, adoptees who are listening. Who's who are going through some tricky stuff with their adopted parents because of this stuff, because of the birth, birth records, then there is some hope. There is hope. Both you and I have seen um, our parents' attitudes changing. Um, so hang on in there, um, adoptees, if you're listening, then this this stuff, it can get it can get better. It can get smoother. And I guess we get used to it, don't we? Yes. We we get used to we get used to their reaction and reactions generally you know there, there can be a big flare-up but things do settle down both in our own in our own hearts because we've we've got used to the idea of of the of the challenge and in their in their heads as well because they they settle down over time yeah it, it was hard though when I first found out about my birth mom because I found I found out she was dead, and so the I had to grieve that. And um, frankly, I needed my parents, and um, yeah, in, instead they added ex extra pain and um, and that I know that was not their intention. I know it wasn't. It was just their fear, really, is what it was. Um, yeah, they are so we're loyal because we don't want to um upset them we don't and we don't want to scare them and they are gonna and and and, and that's not um we're not making that up right that, that is that is real for a lot of adoptive parents that 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 fear is is real so we have to be as sensitive with that as we can right yeah so and i think um i don't know how it is in the uk but in the us it's more adoptions are more open now and you're more likely to know the birth parents names and to have some sort of relationship maybe just pictures and and not always sometimes that doesn't happen but you definitely have more answers and more um, 
yeah yeah there there are more um and there's a lot less infant adoptions these days so most adoptions are from foster care and you know um so that it, the whole thing is a, is is a lot more open well and i think that's very healthy for the adoptee because um I, I don't know about you but i know personally i made up stories in my head about what my um, adoption story must be and why I must have been placed for adoption and at one point I believed Olivia Newton-John was my birth mom you know and um, because that was I, I loved Olivia Newton-John at the time and so that was you know she had to place me for adoption because of her career you know it didn't matter you know she's from Australia and I was born in Texas you know yeah, I just yeah. didn't bother myself with <laughs> facts but yeah and are you still a Olivia Newton-John fan? Absolutely. I, I guess I still want her, but <laughs> she's not on repeat anymore. Am I? No, she's not on repeat. <laughs> it, it is a bit. It is a bit spooky because obviously we uh, listeners. We're doing this on Zoom, right? But um, yes. me, me and Jenna have got the same glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> We've got the same um, kind of tortoise shell, Ray Banny type glasses uh, on. Mm. Uh, so that was the first sort of coincidence, but. Um, the Olivia Newton-John uh, and John Travolta song "Summer Nights" was the first single that I bought, <laughs> but I never thought that John Travolta was my dad. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, making up stories, yeah, making up stories. I I didn't make up any story about being adopted until I was forty. Wow. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, but then I made up a big story, <laughs> a big story. And, and, and my, um, uh, I, there's a lot of anger. There was a lot of anger at that point uh, with, with, with my, towards my birth mother. Um, but yeah, we, we, we make up, we do make up stories. I guess you started making up stories a bit younger than me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you were an Olivia Newton John fan. Yeah. 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 Wow. And she is she is not my birth mother. Just no, no, just, yeah, just for the record. <laughs> just for the record, <laughs> it was made up. It was made. Yeah. Up. yeah. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to um, share, Jana? Because I, I know that you know I've done I've, I've guested on some uh, podcasts listened to by adoptive parents, and they uh, the adoptive parents them they are very the very curious bunch. You know, they are curious. They want to know stuff. Mm. And um, they want insights into how we, into how we feel. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to share? Well, I think one thing that's interesting to me, as I am in my 40s now, um, just the way I've felt about adoption has changed over the years. And, you know, just it's a, it's a journey and you just, um, I learn things about myself and I've realized things about myself and realized the ties sometimes to adoption and, um, and just appreciate, I have a very loving and supportive family and um, my husband and my kids. And I appreciate that to have people that I can talk to and that um, I can work through these issues and they're not detrimental to my health or to my life. And, um, and I guess, you know, to me, adoption is not a shameful thing. It's not a bad thing. It is a part of my identity, but that's not, um, it's, it's not negative to me. It's a positive. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Was there a moment when that realization came to you? Because we live in a world where, you know, everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people say, you know, are trying to try affirmations, right? You know, I must think this, I must think that. And, and the, these affirmations, I, mean, I, I tried them a few years ago and I found them absolutely, it, maybe it's just me, right? Um, <laughs> what, I, I didn't find them useful and people are, um, so what I like to, to draw a distinction is between a realization when you see something for yourself and you kind of, you get it deep in, it's an insight, it's, a, it's an epiphany or a little epiphany, which I call epiphanets. Um, uh, uh, you we realize stuff for ourselves and realizing stuff for ourselves that's a, that's far more powerful than um trying to repeat something that we don't believe you know trying to reprogram our brain i'm not a fan of 
reprogramming my brain, largely because I found it hasn't worked. Um, it's the realizations that were. So was there a realization that you had um, around that? Do, 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 well, I mean, there's, there's lots of different points. I remember one time I was in a, um, a training because um, for my lessons, I do I have to do some trainings. And the training was talking about kids, adopted kids around age five or six, sometimes will start experiencing health issues and unexplained health issues. And a lot of that is their body is trying to help them process the adoption. And um, it just, when I was around age five or six, I had these unexplained medical issues and I had to go to the hospital for testing and they never found out what was going on. And, you know, they're like, we think um, they wanted to send me to a therapist because they thought it was related to my adoption. And my parents were like, no, that's not it. <laughs> you know? and, um, that that is what it was and it's just just that moment hearing a training about something that I actually experienced and making that connection oh yeah that was a real thing and that um, yeah so that's one example but also you know just in relationships and um, I tend to sometimes push people away and not and just stay at a shallow level and um I mean, my husband's very helpful to help me recognize when I'm doing that and just and work through those things and realize that it's more because I don't want to be rejected by people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we may have the same glasses on, but my, my take on my, uh, um, I, I just go full in. So, <laughs> you know, you know um, it's, it's really interesting. Um, uh, I'm going to ask you a, 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 a slightly strange, it may seem like a slightly strange question. So if it doesn't make any sense, just, just say, forget it, Simon. Um, the, um, have you ever had a realisation when you'd, sort of like you'd seen something, some, something had happened in your life and you thought, um, that's down to being adopted. And then you realised it wasn't. I can't think of a time. No. There's nothing that. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm guessing you've had that experience. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, I have had that experience. So, uh, I, I, I'm hesitating whether to go into this or not because I my mood goes up and down. Um, mm -hmm. all the time right and uh, but the adoption happened 54 years ago right so if my mood is going up and down all the time then it can't actually be related to something that happened 54 years ago so it must be something else that's that's kind of how i see it um, um, and there's there's quite a obviously we 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 are here on thriving adopters and we've got a positive view on this adoption on the, this adoption space but there's kind of, kind of a lot of the negative there's a lot of negative uh, there's a lot of shame associated with it so in some circles there's a lot of anger um, and uh, I want to I want to I want to counter that. Uh, and last couple of weeks ago, I found out, um, I found some, a quote from a professor, or it was a podcast with a professor from Harvard Medical School in Boston, a Boston hospital, it was a pediatrics guy. And he said that there's no scientific evidence of the primal wound, of, of what Nancy Verrier calls the primal wound. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he said, you know, see, there's lots of clinical stuff about it, but there's no scientific evidence of it. Uh, and I just thought that's a really, that's a really interesting take on this. And it, it's not one that is common knowledge. We have this, we have all this talk about the, uh, all, all this talk about the negativity and we have this 
one well it's the first guy i've seen really talking about this stuff saying there's no evidence of this primal wound but we seem to have this cultural narrative that is negative um now my my adoption trauma if you want to to put it in 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 short and that didn't happen till i was 40. so this guy saying there's no evidence of the primal wound i don't know i've just it's an area it's an area that fascinates me um and i think for me it goes to what's wounded you know what is it that's wounded um so adoption hurt my hurt my feelings but my feelings aren't who i am I, well, I think it's a part of your soul and it's part of your spirit and um it's fascinating to me meeting my birth family and knowing because my personality was always very different than the family I grew up in. I was, I was, I was loved. I was accepted. I'm not saying that, but I, I definitely, um, my personality was just different. Yeah. And um, so when I found out about my birth mom, and of course I didn't get to meet her, but everyone described her, that definitely um, was not my personality either. And so that was an interesting um, experience. And then when I met my birth father a year ago, um, we are a lot alike with personality. And it's just, but I also know there's things that I have because of how I was raised and um, because of my parents. And so, you know, it's this whole combination. And um, I, I'm thankful for every part of that combination and not just. Yeah. Um, but I know my daughter being adopted at two, I mean, she definitely has things she carries from the time before she was in our family. I mean, it was, she wasn't necessarily, um, she was actually in foster care, which is unusual in China that she was, but it still wasn't family. And it's still, I mean, she definitely, she has some food issues. She has, she had sleep issues for a long time. She has some anxiety issues. You know, she carries stuff from those early experiences and um yeah yeah definitely i I mean it's impossible to separate what is uh you know what people call relinquishment trauma to 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 trauma trauma you know Mm -hmm. know, that's impossible to that's impossible to separate in um in any one 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 person and you know the uh, so i was Five weeks old. My mum and dad collected me when I was five weeks old, and I and I was collect. I'd been in a short term, uh, in short term foster care for five weeks. I think four weeks or something like that. Um, so my birth mother took me there to the foster woman, and then left me there. And then she went back there, picked me up, took me to the adoption council when I was five weeks old. And I was given away, but obviously I hadn't been through any you know you hear, you hear about kids in orphanages and uh, and 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 people in uh, being adopted from foster care and they've been through trauma in the house and abuse and things like that so i haven't clearly i haven't been through any of that but it's impossible to 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 to, uh, to separate what is trauma to do with abuse for example uh, or trauma in a in a in a in something that's happened in an orphanage to what's happened with the actual relinquishment of that and I think different personalities feel will feel it differently. I mean, some if they're more sensitive souls, they may feel even if they were relinquished at birth, they still may feel that more strongly than someone who's not as emotional. I mean, I think that's yeah, yeah, the yeah. personality piece and um, yeah, 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 and uh, just ex- accepting that. Yeah. So, h- how do you explain that to? Um, to parents when to adoptive parents you know in your professional capacity how do you help them see that because i guess if you've got two adopted kids you're gonna they they might have diff- like you were different to your brother right so, um I, I'm, I'm guessing adoptive parents are smart enough to pick that up eh? the fact that they've yeah. got different personality they don't need they don't need us to it would be patronizing for me to say that but um 
we need to be attuned, don't we? Yeah, and, and just um, be that place for the child if they need to talk or if they want to talk. And some of them aren't going to want to do that a lot and others will. Yeah, and, and we pick that stuff up along the way, don't we? Yeah. Is there anything else that you'd like to share? This has been fascinating, Jennifer. Is there anything else you'd like to share that comes up? Um, well, I'm glad adoption's being talked about more. I feel like it's, um, I don't know, for my life, it's clearly, I know it's been a blessing and I'm thankful for it, even, um, and it's, it has made me who I am and I'm just thankful for that. I'm thankful for my life. I'm thankful yeah. to my birth parents. I mean, I just feel, I feel like I have a wonderful life and I feel like my birth mom sacrificed yeah. her own peace and happiness to give that to me. Yeah. And, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much for coming on. So we'll, um, we've, you talked, we talked briefly about the fact that you worked for uh, American Adoption. So I'll, I'll put some, um, uh, I'll put some, a link to that, uh, link to the website on, on the show notes and people can get in touch with the uh, agency if they're, if, if they're looking for some, for some help and support. Okay. So Thank thanks, you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jenna. Thank you. Thanks listeners. See you all soon.